open cars ran cheerfully along the roads full of golf clubs and tennis rackets and picnic hampers. Gypsies were camped in a chalk pit. A green woodpecker, its laughter inaudible to me, flew diagonally across a field. Two children played with puppies on a tiny lawn. Downs rose hazily in the distance. England was looking her best. I, on the threshold of exile, found it expedient to ignore her. I turned to the agony column. The agony column was apropos, but not very encouraging, like the sermon on the last Sunday of term. Because it is so uncertain, as well as expensive, I must wait and trust. The advertiser was anonymous. I put the paper down. Normally I would have speculated at some length on the circumstances which evoked this creed occur. Today I was content to accept it merely as oracular guidance. We were in the same boat, the advertiser and I, as he, or possibly she, pointed out. We must wait and trust. From my typewriter on the rack opposite, a label dangled, swinging gently to and fro in a deprecating way. Passenger to Manchuli, said the label. I wished it would keep still. There was something pointed in such a suave and regular oscillation. The legend acquired an ironical lilt. Well, well, said the label, sceptical and patronising, boys will be boys. Passenger to Manchuli. Had there been any one else in the carriage, and had he been able to decipher my block capitals, and had he in addition been fairly good at geography and at international politics in the Far East, that label alone would have been enough, for he is clearly an exceptional chap, to assure him that my immediate future looked like being uncertain as well as expensive. For Manchuli is the junction on the frontier between Russia and Manchuria, on the Trans-Siberian and the Chinese Eastern Railways, and the latter line had recently been announced as closed to traffic its ownership being in dispute between Moscow and the Japanese-controlled government of Manchukuo. In short, on the evidence to hand, my hypothetical fellow passenger would have been warranted in assuming that I was either up to, or would come to, no good. Or both. With the possible exception of the equator, everything begins somewhere. Too many of those too many who write about their travels plunge straight in media res. Their opening sentence informs us bluntly and dramatically that the prow or bow of the Tao grated on the sand and they stepped lightly ashore. No doubt they did. But why? With what excuse? What other and anterior steps had they taken? Was it boredom? Business? or a broken heart that drove them so far afield. We have a right to know. But they seldom tell us. They may vouchsafe a few complacent references to what they call their wanderlust, but chiefly they trade on an air of predestination. They are lordly, inscrutable, mysterious. Without so much as a hey presto or a hoopla, they whisk us from their native land to their exotic destination so that for the first few chapters the reader's mind is full of extraneous and distracting surmises, as a proctor's must be when he sees a chamber pot crowning some ancient monument of the university. He overlooks the situation's intrinsic interest because he is passionately wondering how the situation was arrived at at all. In this respect, if in no other, I intend to give the reader a square deal. As my label suggested, I had in my pocket a ticket to Manchuli. The reader will wonder why I had bought it. Not, I can assure him, from any love of the place. Manchuli is a small, windswept village lying in a vast, but naturally not less, windswept plain. The population is Chinese, Mongolian and Russian, red and white. In the autumn of 1931, I was held up there for a day, and during that...